cat and cried, Oh, oh! Jim had not yet seen his beautiful present. She held it out to him eagerly upon her open palm. The dull, precious metal seemed to flash with a reflection of her bright and ardent spirit. Isn't it a dandy, Jim? I hunted all over town to find it. You'll have to look at the time a hundred times a day now. Give me your watch. I want to see how it looks on it. Instead of obeying, Jim tumbled down on the couch and put his hands under the back of his head and smiled. Della, said he, let's put our Christmas presents away and keep them a while. They're too nice to use just at present. I sold the watch to get the money to buy your combs. And now suppose you put the chops on. The Magi, as you know, were wise men, wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts to the babe in the manger. They invented the art of giving Christmas presents. Being wise, their gifts were no doubt wise ones, possibly bearing the privilege of exchange in case of duplication. And here I have lamely related to you the uneventful chronicle of two foolish children in a flat who most unwisely sacrificed for each other the greatest treasures of their house. But in a last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that of all who give gifts, these two were the wisest. Of all who give and receive gifts, such as they are wisest. Everywhere they are wisest. They are the Magi. All right, so let's turn now and study this story again. The obviousness of the irony of the story leads one to go, oh, this is kind of an interesting and a, and a, and a, and a very ironic, and, and of course a story that kind of personifies the notion of what true love is. <clears throat> Other than the ending of the story, the last word is obviously magi, and a paragraph where O. Henry basically comes back and says, let me tell you what the moral to this story is. Notice that this story follows brilliantly our plot hill. In other words, in this little tiny text, O. Henry plays the game of exactly what we've said before great short stories do in terms of plot. So let's go ahead and just play the game. Notice in the beginning of the story, you have an exposition. You have the introduction of time, right? You have an introduction of place. We're obviously in the city. You have an introduction of character. Of course, you're here going to have two characters, but we're going to start first with Della and then get to Jim, right? Then we, of course, have some rising action. The decision is, what am I going to do for a Christmas present on the part of Della? Now, of course, the reader will understand that everything Della has gone through in terms of thinking about, oh, I don't have very much money and I got to get a Christmas present, Jim obviously has gone through as well, but Jim's trajectory and story it hasn't been told, right? So the rising action will focus on the character of Della, who, of course, is trying to figure out exactly what she's going to do. We said before that rising action is going to focus predominantly on conflict. Remember we said about conflict that we can have an internal conflict, character versus self, or an external conflict, character versus another character, character versus nature, character uh, versus society, or even an idea that's held by society, right? Jot down in your notes at 2B, what for you is the central conflict of this story early on expressed? Many have said, well, it's a kind of simple economic quest, isn't it? I don't have enough money. I live in a culture where I'm expected to give a present on Christmas. Christmas Day is tomorrow. How can I come up with some money? Of course, any child even can appreciate the idea that around Christmas time I'm supposed to get an adult in my life a gift, but I don't have any money. What will I do? How can I get some money? There it is, right? Of course, the real conflict, many have pointed out, is an internal conflict for her. That is to say, <clears throat> I got this beautiful hair that I'm obviously very proud of, and yet I've decided I'm going to go ahead and get rid of it. I'm not just going to cut it off and sell it for my own needs, but rather I'm going to get enough money so that I can get my guy something that I know he's really going to like, right? Of course, we will then have in our plot hill a climax. 
That is the moment when the conflict of the story comes to its penultimate fruition. And of course, we're clearly aware of where that climax is. He walks through the door. She's got no hair. He's got this weird look on his face that she can't make out. And of course, she'll figure out here in a few seconds when she realizes that uh, he sold his watch so that he could get her these combs for her beautiful hair, right? So the climax of the story, notice, is a very subtle one. You, the reader, want to know what will it be like when she gives this to him and she's cut off all her beautiful hair. She herself even says a small prayer. I hope he still thinks I'm pretty, right? So the question is, will he still love me and think I'm pretty once I no longer have this prized possession of my hair? The counter, of course, argument, or the counter conflict as well, or the uh, contiguous project, is, of course, that he himself got rid of his watch so that the, the watch chain, the fob that she purchased for him, has no value now for him because he's got no watch anymore. The prized possession for him, he also got rid of. Finally, we say in our plot hill that that final resolution, the denouement, the tying together, it of course is going to happen in that last paragraph for O. Henry, where he is in fact going to speak directly to you, the reader, and say, the greatest love is born of the greatest sacrifice. To jump to a 3A observation, for those of you that know your Victor Hugo's classic novel, Les Miserables, right? From whence shall come the shout of love, if not from the summit of sacrifice? There's no question that O. Henry is playing a very similar game. Let's go ahead now and just turn to the text itself and work through it rather quickly. Notice on page 261 at level 1. Notice at 261 now we begin with the fact we've got setting. We've got no money. We've got Christmas Day coming. She will sit down. She's very emotional. She will howl. She will cry, etc., etc. And then finally, she wants the desire for some kind of, uh, of, of gift. The only problem is she's exceptionally poor. Notice the way that O. Henry's word choice plays the game on the bottom of page 261, last paragraph. Della finished her cry, attended to her cheeks with the powder rag, stood by the window, looked out dully at a gray cat walking a gray fence in a gray backyard. The word gray and the repetition of gray, you can jot down in 2B why that's significant, right? She wants to get Jim on 262 something fine. Her gym. The only problem is she has a buck 87 and therefore she has no money. Suddenly, do you see the word three paragraphs down? She, she decides she has an idea, right? Two possessions were told in the house that matter. Her hair, his watch. Notice the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon are both referenced. This is what we call an allusion, A-L-L-U-S-I-O-N, uh, a reference to biblical text, which will make sense because we're going to be messing around as well with the Magi that come from the Bible as well. She will go. She will have her hair um, cut. She will have her hair sold. She will get her $20, and then she will spend hours looking for the perfect gift now that she has the money to get the perfect gift. By the way, the reference on 263, oh, and the next two hours tripped by on rosy wings, forget the hashed metaphor. By hashed here, what O. Henry is saying, he's assuming that you know your Homer, and rosy uh, finger dawn is the, is the actual metaphor. So in other words, O. Henry in his storytelling is saying, in code language, I like to take old stories that you know, and I like to kind of put a twist or a turn on them. Of course, he's going to play that game, especially in his title with Magi itself, right? Finally, of course, we have uh, the uh, gift uh, purchased on 263. Notice she got out her curling irons, lighted the gas, went to work repairing the ravishes made by generosity added to love. And of course, this is O. Henry at his best making the distinction between lust and love. Let's put it in our notes. This is huge at 2A. There is a distinction between lust and love. Lust, of course, is just unbridled desire. We can think of sexual lust, but we can also think about lust for stuff, possessions. Generosity, of course, is about love. The distinction here is a clear one in our story. She is willing, Della, to give up the very thing that she treasures the most because she loves her God. She's willing to make that sacrifice. Of course, the irony is so is he. And of course, the two gifts then count out each other, right? That's the irony of the text, right? Again, the prayer is made on 264. I hope that he still thinks that I'm pretty. And then in the door he walks. 
street. She says to him on 265, be good to me. The irony, of course, is that he's been so good to her that he's gone out, sold his watch, and bought her these, uh, these um, uh, combs. The title is referenced for the first time on 265 with the Magi brought valuable gifts, but that was not among them. And then he says, we'll come back to that one later on. The combs, of course, are gems present. The irony is mentioned there on 265. And now the combs were hers, but the tresses, her hair, that should have adorned the coveted adornments were gone. She hugs them, however, to her bosom. That is to say, she's happy with the gift, even though she can't use the gift. The hope is the other part of this, right? Remember that our three Christian charity values, are, our three Christian values are faith, hope, and love, or charity, right? So you have all three of these obviously kind of played out in this story. Notice the simile at the bottom of 265. Then Adela jumped up like a little singed cat and cried, oh, oh, I've got your gift. And of course, the irony will be personified in Jim's smile, right? I sold the watch. Of course, in the very end, he says, uh, oh, Henry says it, I have lamely related to you the uneventful chronicle of two foolish children. But he'll come back to say about these foolish children, they were the wisest. Of course, why will be the subject now of our level two and three work. Let's do it quickly at 2A. Obviously, the major theme of this story is the real gift is the gift of love. And that gift is always defined through sacrifice, right? At 2B, we've obviously talked a lot about our irony and the situational irony of what, what you expected and what characters expected that be somehow different at the end of our story. At 3A, we've already mentioned a number of texts, but obviously the Magi story itself is the central reference here. At 3B to finish, jot down a time in your own life when you, when you got a gift for someone and it and it was sacrificed for you, and yet you did it. And when you shared that gift with that someone, you somehow felt really good about that gift. Of course, a time in your life that somebody gave you a gift that also was a great sacrifice. Well, there you go, an introduction to our exemplar text, uh, O. Henry's The Gift of the Magi. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this story.